Good afternoon and welcome to the regular meeting of the City of Glendale Commission on the Status of Women. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kojayan. Commissioner Perrion. Commissioner Lamelot. Present. Student next officio, Commissioner Serrano. Present. Student next officio, Commissioner Kim. Present. Vice Chair Miller. Present. And Chair Burns. Present. Would each person, would each commissioner turn on their mic now, please? Mr. T Talian, um, the next item on the agenda, please. Next item on the agenda is the is 1A, report regarding the posting of the agenda. Uh, the agenda for the November 16, 2000 meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall on, November, on or before November 13, 2015. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, please. The next item under uh, introductions and presentations is a presentation on veterans resources in Glendale. The presentation will be made by Stephanie Stone, who is the Chief Deputy Director for the County of Los Angeles Department of Military and Veterans Affair. Affairs. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies, and uh, good evening. My name is Stephanie Stone. I'm the Chief Deputy Director for LA County Department of Military and Veteran Affairs. Um, I am also a 20-year Naval Navy vet. I was going to say brat because I'm a Marine Corps brat and a Navy vet. Um, after serving 20 years in the Navy, I served another seven years working with Coral Southern California as a former fellow in the public affairs field. Um, I currently work with the county and the Department of Military and Veteran Affairs. Uh, shortly after I came to that position, we had a new director that was appointed. Her name is Ruth Wong, who was a retired Air Force general. Uh, we came on board and discovered we were the only two female veterans in the, uh, in the department and recognized the need for programming for specifically for our female veterans. Um, to give you a little background about Los Angeles County, Los Angeles is home to approximately 300,000 well over 300,000 veterans, 6% of whom are women, compared to a national level of 8%. In Los Angeles, female veterans make up a very diverse and largely younger than their male counterparts. 56% of female veterans are people of color, compared to 47% male veterans. In terms of employment, female veterans in Los Angeles earn a medium income of about $9,000, greater than the non-veteran female. That was as of 2012. However, the unemployment rate of all veterans in Los Angeles, both female and male, was 16% in comparison to the 12% of non-veterans. We also recognize that in Los Angeles County, 6% of the female veterans who served after um, September 11, 2001 reported experiencing sexual harassment compared to the 6% of the male, their male counterparts. 38% of female veterans also reported experiencing sexual assault in comparison to the 3% of the male veterans. I can go on and mention and give you the statistics around our female veterans. We recognized um, that there was a need and that we weren't servicing our female veterans when we came on board. We partnered with the Department of Veteran Affairs, the state of California, working with them and the Commission on the Status of Women and Girls from the state of California. We used their, their studies to develop a women's program to meet the specific needs of our female vets. What we found out of the survey was that, for, for the most part, female veterans often didn't self-identify. We came out of the military, we took off our uniform, and let our hair down and changed our clothes, and no one recognized us for who we were. And oftentimes, we didn't recognize each other. So the other challenge that we faced as, as a community was that we didn't get to commiserate much. Unlike our male counterparts who would go to the VSOs or they would wear the ball caps that said Navy veteran, um, we didn't recognize each other, so we didn't often share with each other uh, the stories of our military past. As well, we didn't share with, the, with each other the benefits that were out there or the new programs that were out there. So the third thing that we noticed and noted from their survey was the fact that many of the women veterans didn't know what their benefits were if there were any new programs out there. We didn't commiserate, we didn't self-identify, 
we didn't know our program, uh, our benefits. So in Los Angeles County, we created a women's program specifically for the female veteran and to be um, only for the female veteran. That is to say that we hold a monthly event um, that in, is, in, I say, that is engaging. I hope it is. Um, we're not looking at just having spokespersons or resource fairs, but rather having entertainment and creative opportunities for these ladies to come together and bring them in. And while they're there, they get to sit next to their shipmates and airmen that, are, that were stationed with them, um, talk about and commiserate about their own personal experiences, as well as we bring in resources so that, by the way, did you know, and we invite them to get to learn about their benefits. One of the greatest resources we have in Los Angeles County is our headquarters, Bob Pope Patriotic Hall. And I would invite all the commissioners to come out and visit the hall if you haven't been there yet. It was built in 1925, um, and it was originally built by the Grand Army of the Republic, the veterans from the Civil War and the, um, as well as our Spanish Civil War uh, veterans. And um, it has done it has been used for a number of programs and projects throughout the years to include uh, being a community church, holding court, housing veterans or, or military members as they were being transferred in and out of the states. But with the recent renovation, the Board of Supervisors asked that we make this a one-stop resource center for veterans free to all veterans. So re recognizing the needs for not only our female veterans, but all our veterans, we created a space where all services are free and that we try to include most, if not all, the services that they might need. So this would include meeting with our veteran service organizations, such as the American Legion, uh, AMVETS, um, Vietnam Veterans of America, and the DAV. This is an area where they can come in and host the, their monthly meetings, also meet with their clients as well, posting their claims, disability claims. We also invited our county partners and, and um, uh, partners such as the Department of Social Services, the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Human Resources, the Public Library, county, county Public Library as a resource for our veterans to come in. Oftentimes we forget about these resources and they're right around the corner where rather than have the veteran lost in the process of finding these buildings or other locations, we've invited those, those um, or excuse me, departments into the building themselves so that they can access, access them at the same time that they're coming by to see us to access their benefits. We've invited Superior Court who comes in with um, their self-help family court clinic. Many of our young vets especially are servicing themselves through divorce, and many of them are going through that process. So rather than give, um, have them go through the larger court system where many get lost um, and sign away their benefits, we've, we, um, working with Judge Gordon, um, have developed a self-help clinic that meets once a month there at Bob Hope Patriotic Hall and service, services hundreds of veterans. Similarly, we work with LA County Bar Association. LACBA has done an amazing job. They came to us approximately three years ago and started raising funds to help provide permanent services at Bob Hope Patriotic Hall. So they provide um, pro bono services on a daily basis and coordinate with other attorneys and agencies to come in and, and to provide um, legal services there at the hall, but as well they hold a monthly clinic to clear veterans of tickets and warrants so that they might be eligible for employment. We talked about the women's program. I, I mentioned it briefly. Um, part of that women's program, what we de developed in, um, in our events was to look at bringing in engaging uh, uh, speakers that could lead the women in conversations, not just a speaker with the veteran, but the veterans with each other. So inviting people like uh, Karen Kraft, who is a young Army veteran who is also an experienced um, producer and director 
with the Discovery Channel. We were talking about making transitions and learning how to share one's story well. As a producer and director, she does that every time she moves from one project to another. We invited the founder and, and then president of um, the Soldiers Project, Dr. Broder, who is nationally renowned for her services in, in mental health for the military, to come and speak with the women about, specifically about mental health and to try to break down some of those barriers that we have to talk about issues such as military sexual trauma. I mentioned to you some of the statistics it must be close to 10 years ago, I personally became aware of what that meant, military sexual trauma, and in a um, tour of the veterans um, facility at West Los Angeles and the women's clinic that was just being built there. At that time, the statistics that the researchers were sharing was that one out of five women coming to their clinic were self-identifying as victims of, or survivors, as we call them now, of military sexual trauma. Um, I would say that from what we're seeing today, it still stands at one out of every five, one out of every three if you're a reservist or guardsman. Well, the difference is, is we have better systems of reporting. Um, it's getting out there. The word is getting out that there are opportunities for treatment. And so we're seeing more women reporting, men and women reporting. Um, what we're trying to do at our end is to provide the treatment, to provide the safe space. That's what we do with the women's program. We don't allow, excuse me, <laughs> Mr. Uh, City Manager, but I would say we don't allow men in the room. We, we have invited one gentleman into the, into the space, and that was the regional office. Uh, director, because he was so passionate about sharing the information about how to apply for a claim. And he had his entire staff there to try to help women apply for their claims. And so we allowed him to come in, we allowed him to speak, and then we invited him to leave and allowed us to go through with our, our day's worth of experience. And, and I will share out of that, that one particular day, because we had the, the resources there in the room, we found a woman that had applied for her benefits five years prior, and she was her, her claim was reviewed that day. She was found to be 100% disabled, and she received five years' worth of back pay on that, which was life-changing in the moment, right? It was, it was amazing, and that was because of our relationships. I just would like to close by saying that we recognize, this, we recognize that the need is, is great out there. We're, we're passionate about meeting that need, but we also recognize that we can't do it alone. It's not about the county bringing our resources together. It's about our partners all coming together through the collaboration of LA County, through the, the partnership of the women's program, through the partnerships of the city, uh, city governments. Um, and I think that with our partnerships with the nonprofit organizations and the universities, Thank you for all the research that has given us the information that allows us to put together the programs to be, that have, have proven to be so successful. So with that, I, I leave it to the commission for any questions. Uh, do any of the commissioners have questions for the deputy? I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say thank you for the very informative and articulate report, and um, thank you also for your service. Thank you very much, ma'am. The same thing. I would like to say thank you for this great information. Thank you. you give it to us. Thank, thank you so you. much, Commissioner. Thank you. I have a question for you yes. as well. Thank you so much for your service as well. Thank you. Um, could you just quickly recap the earlier stats for L.A. County in terms of how many veterans there are? We have, we have well over 300,000 in, in the county of Los Angeles. And of that percentage, you then broke it down into a percent right after that, the statement that followed right after that? 6% are women, 6 are women. in comparison to the 8% on a national level. And we, I will say that we have more veterans in our county than any other county in the United States. We have more women veterans than any other county in the United States. We have more homeless veterans than any other county in the United States as well. It's an unfortunate fact, but it is. And when, yes, and when, uh, when you look at the city of Glendale, do you have any specific 
data on the city of Glendale and women veterans? I don't. I apologize. I don't have those. those I don't know out. that it's available, so that wasn't meant to be a trick question. But no. It, you know, one of the things that I will say is that um, we are working with Pasadena City College, which is a neighboring community, and with the VA, which is looking at posting a community clinic at the at the community college, and the office of Judy Chu's. Um, to see if we can also provide some additional services around um, uh, counselors. Our, our office is, I didn't mention this, our office is responsible and our mission is to connect veterans with their federal and state benefits. And oftentimes it requires them to go to uh, a VA hospital or our downtown office. So this gives us an opportunity when we do reach out to the clinics, although we, um, to be able to have a counselor come in and man that space, whether it's on a daily basis, on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis. We're trying to meet those needs wherever we find them. That's great. Thank you. Um, I too would like to echo the sentiments of uh, everybody else for your service. Uh, my question is specifically how have the other organizations uh, supported uh, uh, your cause and your organization. So I, I'd like to have a little bit more clarity as what would be the ask and the, uh, uh, from, this organi from this commission and how we can help. I think the, one of the greatest needs right now that we're seeing in our community is the homeless veteran issues. Um, and, and as a commission that focuses on, on women, I'd say that women and women with children are a great need. Um, we stand in line with our male counterparts. Their, their numbers being greater, sometimes it seems like we're at the back of the line when, in fact, we're just in the middle along with everyone else. I think that um, uh, I recognize that Glendale has also been working on that issue of housing homeless veterans. We're trying to reach out to landlords and property owners to get to have them recognize the value of the hud Bash vouchers. These are vouchers that are issued through the VA that allow for veterans um, that are, um, are, are financially incapable of paying for their own rent to, to um, it's subsidized housing, pardon me. So it's subsidized housing that has wraparound services for the veterans. And it provides, I think, the, the property owners and the landlords an opportunity to see that, that, that veterans aren't a, a scary uh, community, in fact, that we were well, well trained and very capable of, of being great neighbors and good neighbors. So um, we're, we're just looking for opportunities again, great, more opportunities for, for veterans to be housed throughout the county of Los Angeles. That's one way our, our, we're working with our community partners. We're also working with community partners in having them um, both develop in training and provide uh, employment services. We work with community partners around mental health programs. Um, we work with both the VA, uh, the Department of Mental Health, and our community partners because veterans come in all shapes and sizes and they may not feel comfortable going back to the VA or they may not feel comfortable going to the Department of Mental Health, but will find comfort working with, let's say, an outside agency. UCLA has, has programs. Um, the Soldiers Projects have programs sim similar to that. Commissioner could join. I think YWCA in Glendale, it's more involved with the veterans. Absolutely. We were, we were very much involved in your women's program that started up a few years back, um, and you've held a number of, of wonderful projects that have engaged the ladies of the community. And as a matter of fact, our program is taking something from that and that we, from your program in that, we're not going to be stationed in just one, one area this year. Last year was our first year. We held 12 events at Bob Hope Patriotic Hall. This year we're planning on being in the community itself. So maybe starting off um, at Bob Hope Patriotic Hall, reaching out to Los Angeles, going out, going out, to, um, out towards the Pomona area, reaching out to the San Fernando Valley area so that all of our veterans have an opportunity to be connected if you will, and as well as reach out to their benefits. Thank you. I had a, a, one other comment. Um, we recently put out a revised City of Glendale Women and Families Resource Guide, and I'm going to suggest that we add um, 
uh, veteran services category here. So if you could provide the applicable phone numbers Absolutely. and information to staff, I don't see why we can't add it to this. That would be wonderful. Sure. One of the other things that we're doing, we've worked with the city of Los Angeles, and of course LAUSD just made the announcement that they're including within their school district on the emergency questionnaire uh, a, a box to be checked if you've served. Does the parent serve? And the reason we, they, they're doing that is to connect their veterans, excuse me, the, the children of veterans and military with social services as well. We recognize as well there might be an opportunity to complete that circle and, and get their, their parents connected to, as well. Thank you. Deputy Director, I was absolutely thrilled the last Wednesday. Uh, the Elks had a Veterans Day program. Oh, thank and you. guess who was there as the guest speaker? Your general. Ruth Wong. <laughs> yes. Good. She was fabulous. And, I'll pass uh, it along. I think the next day I called uh, Doc. I'm going to call you Doctor. Sorry, Mister <laughs> Tartalian, <laughs> and said, "Ruth Wong, she's a general. We need to get her here. Yeah. We need. We need to have her come." whether she comes uh, next year or January, whenever. And the booklet, the book, are you aware of that and where, where can we get that? And you're talking about the county booklet, informational booklet. We also have a federal informational booklet as well. talking about the one that came from the, from the uh, governor. The state of California. Mm -hmm. We can pass that along as well. We need that. All right. Absolutely. That's it. Thank you so very yes, much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Mr. Toctalian, are we on oral comments at this point? All right. Discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. The commission may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or discussion. Staff may refer the matter to the proper department for investigation and report. I have no cards in front of me, but perhaps there are there is someone that would like to speak and fill in a card. Could we go on to the consent items then, please? Certainly can. Under 4A, it's approval of the minutes of the regular commission meeting held on August 10th, 2015, which was included in your agenda packets. I believe we need a motion to accept the, the uh, August 10th minutes. I move to accept the minutes of the regular commission meeting held on August 10th, 2015. I second. Approve. Okay. That's dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no objections, that passes unanimously. Unless you want me to take a roll call? Yes, we probably should. Would you should. like me to take a roll call? Okay. Commissioner Kojayan? Yes. Commissioner Perian? Yes. Commissioner Lambalot? Yes. Student next official Commissioner Serrano? Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Vice Chair Miller? Yes. And Chair Burns? Yes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I believe that we would be going on to the business agenda now. Certainly. So the next item is business agenda under 5A uh, is a selection of commission officers. Uh, here we'll be asking you to select a chair and a co-chair to serve for a term from November 2015 to November 2016. Uh, and for the details of how that uh, whole process works, I will refer over to my, my esteemed expert in parliamentary procedure sitting to the left of me. Madam Chair, if you'd like a, a brief report, I'm prepared to provide that. Thank you. Um, the, um, the way the process normally works this time of year when we are selecting the chair and the vice chair is that we open up the floor to nominations. Um, we will take them in order, first chair and then vice chair. Um, once the nominations have been have uh, been made, they don't need a second. Uh, then the chair will uh, close the floor to nominations. We, if there's only one uh, nominee, then we will take a roll call vote with um, each commissioner voting yes or no. If there are more than one, uh, if there's more than one name 
um, for each of the positions, then uh, we will also take roll, but um, in response, you will provide the name of the individual that you would like to serve in each of the respective offices. Um, as I said, you do not need a, a second uh, to make these nominations. And so with that, we pass it back to you. If there's a different process which you'd like to follow, then we would have to um, discuss that first and um, vote on that first. But this is a process that this commission has followed in the past. I believe this is the only one we've followed. That's correct. And we would open the, um, what would we do? Open, open the, the floor so, open to the, nominations. Open all, all the floor for nominations, please. I'm nominating Commissioner uh, Burns as a chair for 2015-16. So you're looking for other nominations at this time? Chair. For chair. If I may, um, I'd like to nominate Commissioner Diane Lambelot for the position of chair. Okay. And then the question is, are there any other nominations? If there are no other nominations, then uh, Chair Burns, this would be the time where you would close the nominations, and um, uh, Mr. Tektalian would then do a roll call vote, and we would ask that each commissioner uh, state the name of the individual that they would like um, to, to serve as chair. We're looking for um, three, um, three, three uh, votes for one individual that would then uh, make the majority. And so um, whoever has the three names then will be selected the, um, the chair. Then I will close the nominations. So I'll go ahead and take roll call now. Commissioner Kojayan, who would uh, your, your vote go for? Your, your, your response is either um, uh, Chair Burns or Commissioner Lambelot. Commissioner Burn. Commissioner Perrion? Um, Commissioner Lambelot. Commissioner Lambelot? Vice Chair Miller? Commissioner Lambelot? Chair Burns? Chair Burns. With the um, three um, votes for uh, Chair Burns, then um, Chair Burns, you will continue to serve as the chair of the commission. Congratulations. Thank you. So our next step would be to um, move on to the uh, vice chair. Am I allowed to offer a nomination? Uh, you may, but you'd want to pass your gavel to the vice chair now. I'd like to nominate uh, Sadika Joyan for vice chair. So you're looking for other nominations at this time? I'm looking for other nominations. If there are no other nominations, then you would close um, the I will floor. close the and we will take a roll call vote. Now we're looking for a yes or no response. I'll start with Seda Kujai, uh, Commissioner Kojayan again. Yes. Commissioner Perrion. Agree, yes. Commissioner Lambelot. Yes. Vice Chair Miller. Yes. Chair Burns. Yes. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Did she switch? You don't have to. No. I mean, you don't physically have to make the switch. We'll just do that and look at the next meeting. Do you wish to switch now or um, next meeting. at the next meeting? So we go on to uh, the next uh, part of our business agenda, and that is the update on the Mount St. Mary's uh, report on the status of women. And A... After that, motion providing direction regarding partial draft report. 
Commissioner Burns, members of the Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, at the last meeting in August, uh, the Commission on the Status of Women approved a, a partnership with Mount St. Mary's University produ to produce a report on the status of uh, women in Glendale. The Commission also approved the formation of an ad hoc committee that would work directly with uh, the Mount St. Mary's representatives uh, to put this report's uh, fundamentals together. Based on the direction provided by the CSW, as well as um, the ad hoc committee meetings that have taken place since that time, what we have for you today is a draft outline of what that report looks like, as well as the first three sections uh, in draft format. So very quickly, I'll go over uh, the various different sections. They, they would include demographics, education, employment and earnings, veterans, poverty, health, safety, leadership, and political representation. Uh, we have here today with us uh, representatives from Mount St. Mary's University. Uh, specifically, we have Kimberly Kenny, who is the Associate Vice, Pres uh, Associate Vice President of Institutional Advancement for the university, as well as Dr. Uh, Eleanor Siebert. Um, they'll come up and make a presentation for you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm Kimberly Kenny, and I'd like to also introduce Dr. Eleanor Siebert, who is our uh, former provost and academic vice president, and currently our professor emerita, who leads all of the research, all of our gender research. Um, and I'll help her with the slide presentation this evening. But I just wanted to say a thank you for this opportunity to partner for this very important research. I think all of you know that five years ago, Mount St. Mary's embarked upon our first report on the status of women and girls in California. And since then, we've had the distinct pleasure to work with the State Commission on the Status of Women and Girls and other commissions uh, in Pasadena, in the city of Los Angeles, and in Kern County. So we are thrilled to continue that with Glendale. We're inspired because we like to work in our own backyard, so to speak, and we look forward to providing data for you to create action items to improve the lives of women and girls in your community. And I'm delighted that Dr. Siebert will lead us through a couple of highlights from this first batch of research and answer any questions we have as well. Well, good evening, and um, let me add my thanks to Kim's for inviting us here this evening to share some of the highlights of the first three sections, um, the initial findings on our report on the status of women in Glendale. So we have been commissioned to look at eight topic areas relative to women. I, I think uh, uh, Mr. John <laughs> went over these with you before, demographics, education, employment, and earnings, veterans, poverty, health, safety, and leadership, in which we will include political representation. Um, as a preface, I would just like to say that I've enjoyed getting to know the women of Glendale, just under 110,000 of you, and learning what it is that makes the city of Glendale a unique place in the county of Los Angeles. We're going to share, the next slide please, the key, some key findings, not all of them. In the first three sections, as I said, demographics, education, employment, and earnings. Um, and I would just ask you to remember that as we look at data, remember that we are looking at a collection of individual data points to make a very general conclusion. And the smaller the population size, the less reliable the conclusion. So. Every bit of data has an uncertainty in it, a degree of uncertainty. One of them is the population size that you're dealing with, and another is that all data are only a snapshot, a picture in time, and the major uh, databases that we use are from the Census Bureau, which has just now released its 2014 data. So this is 2015, soon to be 2016, so you can see what we're looking at. May I have the next slide? So one of the first things we looked at in the demographics was the racial and the ethnic distribution of women in Glendale. And you can see that compared to Los Angeles County, where nearly half of the women are Latina, in Glendale, 18% of the women are Latina. 61% of Glendale's women identify as white, 
Although we, we understand that there are many ethnic and cultural distinctions within that grouping, and here in Glendale, according to the U.S. Census, cumulative figures over a five-year period from 2009 to 2013 show that 37% of Glendale's population is Armenian American. And that is a number that has grown from 28% in 2000. And that uh, grouping is found in the, uh, by and large, in that 61% of the white population. Also in contrast to LA County, next slide, Glendale's women tend to be a little older. The median age of women in Glendale is 43 and a half years. While countywide, women have a median age of almost 37 years, which is consistent with the median age throughout the state. Next slide. Now, similar to the county, the state, and the nation, Glendale's older populations are increasingly female. So if we look at the overall population, that's the, whoops, my, I think I've unwound it. Uh, I'm not sure you can see it even there. It's the all ages. Where in the world am I? Oh, thank you. Well, it was a good idea. All ages, uh, if we go over all age groups, 54% of the population in Glendale is female. But as you go to 65 years, we're looking at the blue bars now. At the ages of 65 years and up, 59% are women. And above 85 years, 61% are women. And this will have some impact on the kinds of programs that you look at for the uh, older population. Going to education and educational attainment, Glendale Unified School District has 12,608 girls enrolled in 2014-15. And the demographics in the public school system reflect the female de demographics as a whole. Oops, there it is. So one thing you should notice is that over half of the girls in the K-12 public school system in Glendale are white, that's 54%. And 24%, that's the purple in the circle on the left, the pie on the left, are Latina. And this is in stark contrast to what we find enrolled in the Los Angeles Unified School District, where 74% of the girls are Latina and 10% identify as white. Uh, I will just draw your attention to the fact that Los Angeles Unified School District is a heck of a lot bigger. It's about 25 times the size of Glendale Unified School District. But a, a real point of pride, I would think, in Glendale is the graduation rate from Glendale's public high schools. It's 92% in a timely fashion. That's a four-year uh, high school graduation rate. That's compared to 70% for the Los Angeles Unified School District and 81% statewide. In Glendale, as across the county and state, girls graduate from high school at a higher rate than boys. So let me have the next slide, yes. So you can see that the girls in Glendale graduate at a rate of 94% in four years from public high schools. That's compared to 76% in LAUSD and 85% across the nation. And then compared to boys, 94% of Glendale's girls compared to 90% of Glendale's boys. Both of those rates are very good. And in general, Glendale women are better educated than women countywide. Next slide. Now, I did not put the numbers on here, but 65% of Glendale's women have some college experience, with 39%, and that's the top two bars there for Glendale, 39%, if you add them together, have a minimum of a bachelor's degree. 13%, that's the very top bar, have a graduate or a professional degree, and 26% have a bachelor's degree. 
In comparison to the chart on the right, which is Los Angeles County, 10% of women through the county have a graduate or a professional degree, and 20% have attained a bachelor's degree. Well, let's look at the other end of the scale. 35% of Glendale's women and 44% of Los Angeles County women have a high school education or less. And if we break that bar apart, as the, as the report actually does, you will find that only 15% of Glendale's women, compared to 23% of countywide women, have less than a high school education. <coughs> So related to this higher educational attainment is the fact that Glendale women tend to earn more money than women across the county. Another good news. In Glendale, women who work full-time year-round, and that's important, we're only looking at a subset of, of folks who work. It has to be full-time and year-round. These women have a median earnings of $45,500. That's compared to $40,000 roughly for women across the county and $43,000 for across the state. Now, much, is, much attention recently has been given to the gender wave, wage gap, where women earn less on hold than men do. In the United States, across the United States, women earn 75% of what men do. And for the state, and that's the last pair of bars up there, that gender wage gap is 84%. So women earn 84% of what men do. Again, it's for the full-time, 12-month workforce. And these are median earnings. But in Glendale, but in Glendale, women who work full-time, 12 months, actually have a higher median salary than men. Good news, the gender wage gap is even reversed, and women are earning 105% of what men earn. So you should ask, what are the highest paying occupations where women's full-time working women spend their time? Yeah, the next slide. The highest paying occupational clusters, these are broad clusters of occupations. Are computer and mathematical occupations, number one. Number two, arts, entertainment, and media. Number three, health diagnosing and treating. Four, management occupations. Five, business and financial. And six, legal occupations. Again, I want to stress that these are very broad occupational clusters, and within each cluster, there are many types of jobs. So under legal occupations, you would find anything from a law clerk to an attorney. Under health diagnosing, you would find anything from a vocational nurse to a surgeon or a physician. Okay? But you can see that the median salary for women is quite high. i just also like to note that um, the um, uh, potential for growth in women, for women in a uh, particularly in computer and mathematical occupations, where they comprise currently only a quarter of the workforce, and in management occupations, where they currently comprise a third of the workforce, the growth potential there is, is quite large. And so we will move finally then to the last uh, data slide that I have this evening, and that's the four broad occupational fields where most Glendale women who work full-time actually spend their time. So there are four occupational clusters here. Personal care and service, 88% of that workforce is female. Education, training, and library workers, 87% of that workforce is female. This is in Glendale. Healthcare diagnosing and treating, 72% are female. That includes uh, nurses. Um, registered nursing uh, in the county, about 80% of those are female. And office and administrative support, the secretarial sector, 72% are female. Note here, though, that of these four 
occupational clusters where most of the women are working, only one of them is, in, is among the highest paid, and that is the healthcare diagnosing and treatment. In particular, personal care and service workers, 88% of whom are women, don't earn much more than minimum wage. And the office and administrative support women are not far behind with a median salary of $36,000. Of course, it's our contention that a diverse and educated workforce utilizing the talents of both women and men will benefit not only women and their families, but will drive a vibrant economy to the benefit of everyone. Glendale is really well positioned with a strong force of working women to lead the county in neutralizing some of these persistent economic gender gaps. Have the next slide. We have some next steps. These are the first three sections. The next step is to get, we have a conference call. It's hard to, hard to uh, schedule these. We'll get some feedback um, uh, on the first three sections. We have actually a draft of the entire report, so we do have that veteran information that you were looking for. Um, and the whole process will be completed by February. So we're moving pretty quickly. I actually look forward to uh, sharing more of the emerging picture of Glendale's women with you in the future. I want to thank you again for the invitation to speak and to your interest and action in addressing women's issues. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. That was terrific. Um, very interesting. I just wanted to make a comment. I am um, the, the commission delegate to the uh, ACCW, which is the association or California Commissions on Women. And um, we're, and I'll report on this briefly later, but we're preparing for an annual conference coming up in January. And um, I'm working on helping put together a panel on issues affecting senior women. Um, and I'm actually learning a lot that I didn't realize, um, and most of it isn't good. But with regard to the inequality in pay, I think a lot of people think of it as a an issue for the present, but when you project it out a few decades, we've got senior women who are um, on average earning something like $1,000 a month less than Social Security, and they live longer than men, and it's, you know, uh, a real, real issue. Um, I didn't realize that many of our senior women actually are at the poverty level, um, and these are women that may have even worked all their lives. Thank you. Continue making the motion providing direction regarding partial draft report. Commissioner Burns, first of all, I want to thank the speakers for the presentation. Quite a bit of uh, interesting information coming out of it. Looking forward to hearing what uh, what uh, what statistics we get in the following phases of this uh, evolution here. I think from staff's perspective at this point, uh, what I think would be helpful to us, um, as well as uh, to the, the authors of this report, would be a little bit of feedback from the commission members, whether or not the information that's being presented is indeed what was anticipated, um, or uh, basically, are we on the right track of the type of report that was initially envisioned? Um, if we're not, if there's additional things that we need to be thinking about, now is the time to provide that feedback to, to me, um, and we'll go back and work directly with our, uh, our consultants on this. If you don't have any feedback at the moment um, and you think of something down the road, I ask that you direct those comments directly back to me uh, so that we're not dealing with any potential Brown Act issues. I had a question. I assume that the data that's being collected, um, it, it, that's being presented in the report is um, all that's collected. In other words, there aren't portions or types of data that are being left out of the report. Is that accurate? Uh, hi, that's a really interesting question. What we're trying to do is present, uh, Eleanor does a first draft that presents um, 
several different pieces of data that will, are relevant to the different issue areas. And then within the advisory committee and the commission, we're looking for you for guidance to what would be the most pertinent for the city of Glendale and the issues that you're working on for women and girls in this community. If there is something missing or something that is a burning question, we can try to get that, Eleanor uh, will try to get that data and uh, include anything that we feel is necessary. Um, thank you, that was a good question. And regarding the data, I know you, uh, when you presented it, you touched on the source being the U.S. Census uh, 2014. The, I, I'm a little unclear um, as to uh, exactly what the data is, and uh, I'm, I'm sure it's a, a, a sampling statistics. It's not polling the uh, entire population from the 2010 census. So I'd like to know um, uh, who initiated the survey and how it was rolled out and if it was a randomly selected uh, group of individuals. Uh, just a little bit of uh, background as to how it was handled and exactly how many responses were received. That's a, an excellent question. I'm going to have uh, Dr. Sieber come join me up here so we can both answer questions. Good. So um, it is from the uh, Census Bureau. Okay. okay. We, d we do not do any primary research, so it's not that we go out and sample. The methodology is well tested. What they do is they build on the decennial census numbers, and they have what they call an American Community Survey annually. And they, um, I honestly cannot remember how many households and people they interview, but it is an interview, okay. and so they are going on what people tell them. Then they, they match up. <laughs> it gets tricky. But what I they do is they match up the annual results to make sure it's more or less in line, that they don't get a really weird result for one data set. So the outliers are omitted, yes. and that's, yes. that's appropriate. And there's a, whole, there's a whole thing on errors. And what we have done in our report is round the numbers off. The percentages are generally whole numbers so that that reflects the uncertainty in the data. So if it's reported as 99%, it means it's 99 plus or minus 2 or 3 or 4%. If it's 100, just 100, then it could be 90 to 110%. Okay. It's in the number of digits you use to report the data. Is that okay? That's fine, thank you. If I, <clears throat> thank you again for this report. And if I may add just a couple comments um, further for my fellow colleagues so that it will generate some of the questions. Just a couple things in terms of the tangible actions. As um, Mr. Taktalian said, we are having a conference call on Wednesday, the ad hoc com committee being Commissioner Kajoin and myself. Some of the comments, I, did you receive my comments? Were they forwarded? We did, I did receive your comments. Yes, they weren't included in this um, we in this presentation because this was the first draft that uh, sure. we sent to the entire commission. Sure, and the reason I asked that is more just if, to help if any questions are being generated by my fellow colleagues, then I, I wasn't anticipating an answer uh, today. You've both been very clear about what we would get today, and it's wonderful so far. Um, but that being said, for example, within the demographics, um, while we know that Glendale is very rich in um, its diverse community, we also um, sent questions back to see if there was any way we could possibly get closer between uh, the category you identified as whites, correct? That is the term in whites Armenian versus whites non-Armenian, correct? To see, And you've given us the data that is most available in L.A. County, right? Per perhaps then there might be as well as, we Glendale. as well as Glendale. Glendale, Glendale yeah. and the county, but you're right. Because we, we want to dive deeper, doctor. If, if possible, we were hoping to dive deeper in that number. Yes, I think when we had our initial call, we asked you if you had any data sources here that you might be able, here in Glendale, that you might be able to pull on. The census traces ancestry, but um, 
again, the sample size is so small, they won't do it for one year for Glendale, so they accumulate data over a five-year period. And, and they don't separate, separate it out uh, on the basis of gender. Again, it, it really has to do with the si sample size and the uncertainties or the unreliability that would result. But you know, if you have, um, if you have some data, I mean, I, I looked through the Armenian American diaspora trying to find something that would focus in on this part of the uh, world, and I, I just couldn't find it. So maybe you have some sources. I'd be happy to hear those. Yes. And may I add, I think uh, when we discuss this, for, so for example, with the research we did with the city of Los Angeles, that research became much more robust when the city was able to access around whatever specific issue area that data for us. So I don't know if you have any special commissions working on any of your population areas that may hold this information, um, but we don't have any other access to anything unless maybe the city has something like that or some other organizations I think you may have mentioned. I have a question. What is specific you want from Armenian well, I, I think in response, I was, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Commissioner Miller, asking to do a deeper dive to really get, so if we have a 61% white population that's self-identifying as white, and we'd like to, excuse me, we being the commission would like to dig deeper to find out a closer number, we're asking for your help to do that as well in the city of Glendale. So that's the information we can't get from 61% to, you know, 41, I'm making up this number right here. Um, without additional detail because that's not available in the census. So, Help? and it helps a great deal, at least for me. So the takeaway for our commission on that is as we're reading this report, if there are things that we want that are deeper and we know the sources that we can provide, our consultants from Mount St. Mary's are very willing to go there. That's really the message in terms of, so for example, one of the other comments I made, I think the education section is robust and fantastic and really just really identifies, again, what a wonderful city Glendale is with, with statistics like that. But in terms of now seeing this report in the hands of people who are reading about the education. It might be interesting to know just little things like, for example, how many schools are in the K through 12? How many high schools? So when you're thinking of feedback, perhaps you might consider that. Uh, another thing to think about when you're reading the report is if in the veterans, the reason I asked the earlier question about the veterans section is really to understand how many veterans we have in Glendale and, and how deep we want them to dive into that area when in fact it, we have other areas that we can dive into. Because aren't there only like seven or ten? What's the number? It's very uh, low. You have 49 women veterans. <laughs> 49 women veterans, and that's, uh, that's really quite a small, small number, so I can't get any gender disaggregated data. I can get mm -hmm. the veterans together, but uh, it's like 99% male, so any veteran figures you will be seeing really may or may not be representative of female veterans. So, for example, although we know that that's very, we very much want our report to also be reflective and in line with the California State Commission and the other cities that have done this. What we know in Glendale is that based on that number, we might choose to really go deeper into other categories and spend the money and the time that way versus this. That's all that's about. It's not, it's not, the discussion isn't about is it good data or not good data. It's, it's useful data. It's just a matter of what we want this report to look like, what we think matters to city council, what we think matters to the consumer within the city of Glendale. So when we're reading it, we want to read it with those eyes as best. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. That that um, is very helpful. And, and my only comment is that as far as a deeper dive, I think we need to be selective about how many areas that we actually request to be more detailed um, because I think there isn't, you know, if the sampling isn't going to provide us with a result that's accurate or, or 
more significant, I guess statistically significant, then I don't think we want to include it. I think there are very obvious areas where, it, you know, like demographics, where it would make sense to have more detail. But I don't think that that's my personal opinion is it's not necessary across the board. May I make a comment on that as well? Uh, given the experience, just in terms of the reports we've done, also just couple things to think about. Yes, the agenda. What are your action items as a commission? But also thinking of um, your customer and says, who is reading this report? What, what is the page number for burnout? And I mean that sincerely, looking at the city of Los Angeles, where I think we have you know, you know, 400 pages. And who's <laughs> going to read that? And so that's OK. What key highlights? How are we going to format this report in a way that is usable for any citizen, woman, or man in your in your city who's going to be able to call out what they need. So really looking, and I think um, Commissioner Lambalot, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing your last name, brought up a really good point. Where do you want to do a deeper dive that's going to be most effective for the agenda that you're pushing forward for the city of Glendale? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So if your ad hoc committee could have all your feedback by Wednesday, we could wrap this up in a week. We're actually looking to have the comments sent over to staff to avoid it. That was uh, Brown not Brown. intended to be a serious thing. <laughs> Settle down. Wednesday, as in this Wednesday. Right, I because we had the ad hoc committee on Wednesday. No, no, I just meant yeah. that the comments should still yeah, go back to we staff. Know. Uh, and back to following staff's direction. Everyone was clear on that, right? Actually, I'm not. So when do feedback we have to return the feedback? And If you have any additional comments or feedback uh, that you'd like incorporated to this report, I ask that you please provide that information to me. You can either call me or send me an email, whatever's more convenient for you, and I'll pass it along to the ad hoc committee okay. members. And who by when? By Wednesday, before they meet with... Um, uh, I have a phone conference Wednesday afternoon on this particular topic. But you'll accept their comments after Wednesday, correct, Mr. Tuktalian? Absolutely. Yeah, it's I was being zealous and, and over the top there, but thank you for supporting Wednesday as well. Thank you. Shall we go ahead now with reports, uh, the legislative updates, please? Thank you, Commissioner Burns, members of the commission. Uh, the next report is our legislative update on the various different bills that the commission had asked to uh, take a particular position on. Each year, the Commission on the Status of Women develops a legislative platform, and what uh, staff utilizes that, that legislative platform to help identify bills uh, that are going through the Assembly and the Senate and bring it back to the, the Commission to see whether uh, commissioners want to take a support uh, or opposed position on, on these bills. Once that determination is made, we then go and work with our state lobbyists uh, to make sure that the Commission's comments uh, and our City Council members' uh, affirmation of those comments are being followed through appropriately. Uh, the five uh, specific legislative platform items uh, that the Commission has taken a position on previously is um, women in the workplace, women's health, women in the budget, women in the military and military families, and women in po uh, post-secondary education. Um, at the last uh, Commission on Status of Women meeting, uh, Christine Powers provided a legislative update on the current status of various legislation that was still going through the process. Uh, the governor had not taken any action on uh, any of these items yet. What I'll do today is go over those six particular uh, bills and, uh, and very briefly, because these tend to get very lengthy if you've uh, taken the time to read the full text, very briefly provide a summary of what each bill is, uh, the position that the commission members took, uh, to support or oppose that legislation, and ultimately what the final disposition was, whether the governor supported it or opposed uh, or uh, vetoed it. And uh, if it was vetoed, I'll provide uh, the veto message just as uh, uh, some justification or explanation as to why he took that action. The first one was Assembly Bill 202, and that dealt with professional sports teams, uh, specifically cheerleaders and employment status. Uh, under existing law, uh, it prescribes comprehensive requirements relating to minimum wages uh, related to overtime compensation and standards for working conditions that protect employees uh, under different employment 
uh, relationships. This particular bill uh, would require a cheerleader who is utilized by a California-based professional sports team during ex ex exhibitions, events, or game, uh, games uh, to be deemed an employee for compensation purposes. Um, the bill also requires that the professional sports teams ensure that the cheerleader is classified as an employee for those purposes. So uh, essentially, you're, you're not dealing with um, a particular profession that's not compensated uh, appropriately. The commission had taken a recommend uh, support position on this, and ultimately on uh, July 15, 2015, uh, the bill was approved by the governor. The second item was ACR 50, or Assembly Concurrent Resolution 50. Uh, this was a resolution in the State Assembly re related to Equal Pay Day. Uh, it proclaimed April 14, 2015 as Equal Pay Day in recognition of the need to eliminate the gender gap in earnings by women and to promote policies to ensure equal pay for all. Ultimately, uh, that was a support position that this commission took, and that was enrolled and filed with the Secretary of State on August 8, 2015. So for all intents and purposes, it passed. The third item was SB 358 uh, related to conditions of employment and gender wage differential. This was another item that the Commission on Status Women took a uh, recommended, uh, recommended supporting. Uh, and the summary of this particular bill uh, deals with existing law which regulates the payment of compensation to employees by employers and prohibits an employer from conditioning employment on requiring an employee to refrain from disclosing the amount of his or her wages, signing a waiver of the right to disclose the amount of those wages, or discriminating against an employee from making such disclosures. Um, it, it's, it's fairly lengthy. I can go into additional uh, verbiage on this particular issue, but that's the general crux of it. This particular bill uh, would prohibit an employer from prohibiting uh, the employee from disclosing the employee's wages, discussing those wages with others, or inquiring about somebody else's wages. Um, and it would also protect them if they chose to aid or encourage any other employee to exercise his or her rights under these provisions. So essentially an employer can no longer take uh, uh, an adverse employment action just because somebody fa asked or s was seeking out uh, information about somebody else's pay for the purposes of determining whether or not their pay was equal to that. Uh, the commission uh, recommended to support this particular bill, and ultimately the governor approved it on October 6th, 2015. The fourth bill that the commission had taken a position on was SB 406, again related to employment as it related to leaves. Um, Specifically, the, the Moore Brown Roberti Family Right Act uh, makes it a lawful employment practice for an employer to refuse to grant a, a request by an eligible employee to take up to 12 work weeks of unpaid protected leave during any 12 month period for either bonding with a child who was born, adopted by, or placed in foster care with that employee, or to care for the employee's parent, spouse, or child who has a serious health condition or because the employee is suffering from serious health condition rendering them unable to perform the functions of the job. The commission had taken a support role, uh, a support position on this particular bill, but the governor vetoed it. And in the governor's veto message, um, he wrote, and I quote, I am returning Senate Bill 406 without my signature. This bill expands the circumstances under which a qualified employee may take up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave under the California Family Rights Act. I support the author's effort to ensure that eligible workers can take leave to care for a serious, seriously ill family member. The expansion provided in this bill, however, creates a disparity between California's law and the Federal Medical Leave Act, and in certain circumstances could require employers to provide employees up to 24 weeks of family leave in a 12-month period. I am open to legislation to allow workers to take leave for additional family members that does not create this anomaly. So in essence, the governor has stated that he understands what the intent of the bill was. He's not in opposition of that particular intent. However, because of a disparity between the, the FMLA and this particular bill, um, there, there could be potential for either abuse or uh, misapplication. So at this point, um, I'm not sure exactly whether or not the author of that bill is going to try to resubmit that in the following uh, legislative session, which I believe ta uh, starts again in January, on January 4th, 2016. Uh, so perhaps if that is the case, we would bring that back to this commission to see um, if it would support um, this piece of legislation again as it was originally drafted um, or with some level of amendment. Um, but that will be certain at a later time when, when there's additional language available. 
The fifth bill that the Commission had taken a position on was AB 545, dealing with domestic violence. Under existing law, a battery committed against a spouse, a person with whom the defendant is cohabitating, a person who is the parent of the defendant's child, a former spouse, a fiancé, or a person with whom the defendant currently has or has had a dating or engagement relationship, is punishable by a fine not exceeding $2,000 or by imprisonment in a county jail for a period of not more than one year, or by both the fine and imprisonment. If probation is granted, existing law requires the defendant to complete a batterer's treatment plan. This particular bill um, additionally requires a uh, person who has a previous conviction of, of willfully inflicting corporal injury in a domestic violence case to be imprisoned for not less than 48 hours if probation is granted for the subsequent offense. This was a particular, um, this was a bill that the Commission on Status of Women took a support position on and the governor in fact approved it as it was drafted on October 8th, 2015. The final bill that uh, the Commission took a position on uh, was SB 333 and it dealt with controlled substances. Uh, this particular bill was vetoed by the governor and um, this, this bill dealt with existing law which makes it a misdemeanor to sell, dispense, distribute, furnish, administer, or give, or offer to sell, dispense, distribute, furnish, administer, or give, or possess for sale any synthetic stimulant compound or any specified synthetic stimulant derivative, cannab uh, cannabinoid compound, or a synthetic cannabinoid de derivative. So under existing law beginning uh, January 1st, 2016, um, it would be an infraction to use or possess these drugs. This particular bill, as it was drafted, would expand a definition of synthetic stimulant compound and a synthetic cannabinoid, uh, and it would further um, offer that the first offense for using or possessing these substances be punishable as an infraction, a second offense be punishable as an infraction or a misdemeanor, or a third or subsequent offense be punishable as a misdemeanor. Again, the commission had recommended supporting this particular piece of legislation. It was ultimately vetoed by the governor, and again, in his message, he um, returned a number of bills, and specifically he returned nine bills, um, and said each of these bills creates a new crime, usually by finding a novel way to characterize and criminalize conduct that's already prescribed. This multiplication and particularization of criminal behavior creates increasing complexity without commensurate benefit. Over the last several decades, California's criminal code has grown to more than 5,000 separate provisions covering almost every conceivable form of human misbehavior. During the same period, our jail and prison populations have exploded. Before we keep going down this road, I think we should pause and reflect on how our system of criminal justice could be made more human, more just, and more cost effective. Um, so this is really along the lines of some of the, the other positions he's taken on, on criminalization, uh, AB 109 being one of those, uh, those examples, uh, prison overcrowding, jail overcrowding being uh, the primary culprits. Um, again, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen in the next legislative session. This bill could potentially come back uh, and we'll have more information for the commission to uh, take a position on. That concludes my very quick summary of a rather lengthy uh, <laughs> presentation. I'd be happy to try to get into any details if there's any questions. Um, I'll turn it over to the commission. Commissioners, are there any questions? Thank you. We shall continue with the uh, commission and staff comments, please. Chair, we have to... Thank you. Chair Burns. Yes. Uh, can, may I go back with a question about the Mount St. Mary's report before we go on to the next item? Yes. We, we just need to read that back into the record. What would you say? We would need to read that back into the record so we can open that back up to discuss. So to read that, that particular item back in the record, uh, we're going back to uh, 5A2, an update on Mount St. Mary University's um, report on the status of women in Glendale. My question is two-part, and first um, I'll direct it to staff to make sure that we can do this. But these slides that are that the Mount St. Mary's brought uh, consultants brought with them, could those be made available to the commissioners as they read the report, um, perhaps? And then my question is, wouldn't you find that helpful if you could see how they take the the material and what it's supposed to mean, or or certainly. So if possible, if, if 
the request is is if staff, if it's not too much in the next day, if we could get a copy of those, that'd be awesome. Not at all. May I ask a question? Will the graphs be included as part of the report? It'll be all their slides, right? I mean in the final report that's yes. produced to the commission? I have not seen them included in the final report as of yet. I think it was the, uh, they had presented it this way just as a, uh, a visual, almost like an infographic. If the, uh, if the preference is that we include actual visuals in the report, we can certainly do that. I mean, the data is already there. And, and per personally, I think it would be helpful. I agree. I think it would be very helpful. Right. Thank you. We shall carry on them with the uh, ad hoc committee updates. Who would like to begin? Okay. Commissioner uh, yeah. Joyen. As everyone know that on August uh, 10, we form a ad hoc committee for education and outreach. It was me and Commissioner Diana and Regina. We met in August 24 in management services and we talked, we discussed how we can bring these subjects. And first we talked about to establish subject for speakers, presentation for next three, the next three meetings for Commission on Status of Women. First one was in November, so we had uh, about the veterans. The second will be in February for human trafficking. Uh, I guess the staff will check with the Soroptimist uh, because like months ago, they have a good panel presentation about this subject. And in May, we will discuss about sexual assault. And uh, this is the first category, and I would like Commissioner Diana to continue elaborate more. Thank you, Commissioner Kajayan. Um, we discussed a number of topics. Uh, I'll go over a few that I think um, are, are most important at this point. Uh, one was we, um, we discussed the resource guide and uh, decided that the Glendale logo should be uh, included as part of the guide so that it is um, you know, eye-catching and attractive and consistent with other city materials. Uh, and as we discussed earlier, um, I think it would be great to have veteran services added, but we would also, the ad hoc committee would also ask the other commissioners um, if there are any other areas that you would like included in the resource guide to let us know, to let staff know. I know it was recently redone, so that may not be the case, but uh, just in the event there is anything else. Uh, we also discussed uh, a means of recognizing women uh, that the commission could take action on recognizing women. We talked about a wall of fame, um, having a woman honored at one of our meetings or each of our meetings. That is still under discussion. No decision has been made, but it was, uh, it was brought up and discussed. Also, um, the um, state assembly uh, select committee hearings on uh, the status of women and girls of color uh, is holding statewide hearings. And they started uh, a few months ago, I believe, and I think will go on for some time. When I attended the ACCW meeting in June, they asked for cities to volunteer to hold those meetings there. Uh, at, at the city, so we talked about the feasibility and desirability of holding one in Glendale. It wouldn't be anything the city would be endorsing per se, but we would uh, be a forum uh, and a setting for one of those meetings to be held and people, the public to attend. So we're in the process, and staff I think is in the process of investigating that feasibility and desirability. Can I add one more? Also we talked about uh to identify local agencies and all organization get, that can take the program that we have, Camp Rosie, we discussed because th that was a very good program. So we discussed about that too, which uh, organization we can talk, that staff was going to go ahead and look. Christine was with us in that meeting. That is something we'd like to yeah. see continued on some level, uh, certainly if it can be. In the commission, I think we would. We'd like to continue. Uh, yeah. Yes. The 
Commissioner Miller. The ad hoc committee that I worked on uh, was the first one that was pressing was the Mount St. Mary's report. And we've had a, um, an initial meeting. We've had a phone conference follow up. We've had this meeting and we'll have another meeting on the 18th. So um, I'm working on that on that ad hoc committee with Commissioner uh, Kajoyan. And um, as stated, there should be some action item for this commission to look upon in February. The additional ad hoc committee that was created between myself and Commissioner Parian, we have not met yet on, on those items and we will likely have a report for you in February of recommendations, nothing more. Was that the um, financial? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, would you, Commissioner, would you have anything to add to this? No. All right. Um, we worked on um, relationships between um, 501c3s. And please, as I'm reading the ones that I've written down, if you have, if you have groups that you want to add for consideration, please do. Um, ARC Family Center, Ascensia, the D.D. Hirsch Mental Health Services, the Door of Hope, and the G.A.R. Services. Is that the Campbell Center now? I, I believe it is. I think it is. I wasn't sure. But anyway, I made a note Campbell Center. The Girl Scouts of Greater Los Angeles, Girls on the Run, Glendale Healthy Kids, and the YWCA of Glendale, particularly supporting the domestic violence um, shelter and uh, the uh, veterans. I would be I would like any other groups. What ad hoc is this? This is the relationships. Community partnerships. Community partnerships. partnerships. Uh, can we add Armenian Relief Society? Oh, it's 501. Okay. Yeah. So we, the Armenian Relief Society. Okay. And then any others right at this point for consideration? at this point. I think that this is a, a general list. I was trying to, to uh, think of a, a broad spectrum of um, 501c3s that we might um, establish or already have established re relationships with. So if there are any others, I believe you all know how to reach me. And I think that's a great idea. Were we not going to, did we not hand out a group of these a couple of months ago or three months ago? Do you recall that, Commissioner? Yes, I believe um, that was the case. They were brought to the meeting, and I should have added in my um, report on the outreach committee, education outreach committee, that one of the other items we discussed with respect to the resource guide was expanding distribution and where we could do it within the confines of, uh, you know, city buildings or offices vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, as opposed to private um, uh, businesses. So that is certainly a goal to get these more widely distributed. Are there any other... Um 501c3s that we might possibly want to consider putting um, as a relationship on a relationship list. We don't need to do that now. However, please give it some thought if, if um, you want anything else added to that. Uh, then we're going to go to Commissioner comments, please. Commissioner Kim. I'm Serrano. I have no comments. Commission, uh, Commissioner, um, oh my, I'm terribly sorry. I wanted to call you by your first name, but 
that doesn't work very well, does it? Perian. <laughs> uh, Commissioner per Perian. No comments. No comments? Commissioner? I was just wanted to mention briefly, um, I know I brought it up a few times, the ACCW Association of California Commissions for Women. Uh, the annual conference for the ACCW is being held in Sacramento on January 22nd, 2016. Uh, the conference is called um, Advocacy in Action. Obviously, any commissioners can attend that want to. Um, the keynote speaker will be Serena Khan, who is CEO of the California Women's Foundation. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm working on the planning committee, and um, since the, our next meeting will be held after January 22nd, I'll have a full report um, during our February meeting. Where this meeting will be held? Sacramento. Sacramento. Um, what are the costs? Uh, I'm sorry. Class, what are the costs if you wanted to attend? Uh, I need to check on what the ticket cost is. Uh, travel costs are up to us, so it would be whatever flights, you know, whatever costs you have for the flights. But I'd be happy to find out what the ticket costs are. Commissioner Kajorian. I, I would like just to say happy Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving is next week. And also we are not going to see each other until... February. After Christmas. After Christmas. So Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Wishing you all happiness, success, and health. Commissioner Miller. I echo those same comments of Commissioner Kajoyan since uh, um, first off starting here. It's, we've done a lot of good work since the last time we were together. May we keep that up. Um, and also wishing everyone a very happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. Do we get Valentine's Day in there? Yes, it's February 15th. <laughs> I know. <but> what, <laughs> is, what date is our next meeting? It's in February. Here, the calendar. It's, I think it's February, February 8th. 8th. Uh, we will miss. So you can uh, come to a very compelling Live Well luncheon in the afternoon and come to the commission meeting at night. Can do that. Anything else uh, that needs, uh, that you need or would like to uh, talk about? Oh, no? I have no comments. All right. I'll go ahead and then staff is going to, uh, going to tell us about an hour and a half worth, right? Absolutely. Well, we want to say congratulations to Christine and uh, Martin Powers. They had a darling little a baby girl named Olivia, and um, we hope that we see her sometime soon in person. The pictures are adorable. Uh, Senator Liu had a, a conference on aging, and uh, I'm wondering if the... I attended. If the information uh, would be valuable to the ladies that... Uh, came to speak with regard to uh, Mount St. Mary's. There was a health fair on November 7th, and uh, November 12th, the YWCA held a healthier coalition, and I believe that uh, all our hospitals were involved amongst others. Uh, I don't know whether it, this is health or not, but certainly it was a big ribbon cutting on the main library. Uh, as they're going ahead with, I believe it's 16, 17, 18 million dollars worth of renovations. And then um, the General Ruth Wong spoke uh, on Veterans Day, and I do hope that we can get her to come to speak to us. Uh, that would be all I would say, except Happy uh, Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, and uh, staff comments. 
Other than thank you for allowing me to join you tonight. Uh, this is probably the first and, and last for, for this year, uh, not because I don't like it. Uh, actually, Christine will be returning, as far as I'm aware, um, after her maternity leave is up. So we do wish her the best. I'm sure she's home watching us now. Um, she, I, know she's been, I know she's been watching. Let's just put it that way. Um, and it, it was a pleasure being here with you folks tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All done. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. We shall adjourn at 7. Give me the time. 7.03. 7.03. Thank you very much.